Welcome back. In this video, we're going to continue exploring the theme of how Jesus gave his life as a ransom for us in order to heal the breach caused by the sin of our first parents. Here's a brief summary of what we discussed last time. Humanity is separated from God and in bondage to the devil. This was the result of the sin of our first parents. God, however, plans our redemption from the moment of that separation and seeks to bring us back to him. The means by which he does, does this is that Jesus Christ gives his life as a ransom for us. Having been ransomed, we may then hope for eternal life, as is prophesied by Isaiah. So let's think about how exactly Jesus affects that ransom. You know, to ponder this, we also think about an important biblical theme about bondage, which is the bondage of the Hebrew people to Pharaoh, as described in the book of Exodus. God ultimately sets his people free from the bondage of Pharaoh, and the key to setting them free is the sacrifice of the Passover lamb, as depicted in the book of Exodus. We take up this theme again in the Gospels. And so, in particular, we're going to look over at a famous passage from the Gospel of John. So, look at John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, the John, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God. That's a pretty powerful title when you think about it in terms of the idea of the Passover lamb. John is making a reference to the Passover here. Both John the Baptist and John the Evangelist are doing so quite, quite deliberately. And throughout the Gospel of John, we receive numerous hints to reinforce this idea. So we're going to jump ahead of it to chapter 19 in the Gospel of John, where Jesus, the Lamb of God, is dying on the cross. So if we look over to John chapter 19, verse uh, 14. So 19, 14. Note. So this is when Pilate is sentencing Jesus to death, and he says, and John, the evangelist, observes, now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. So this is happening on Passover. Jesus being sacrificed as the Lamb of God, it's no coincidence that this is happening on Passover. Now let's look ahead a little bit. Look at verse 28, we see, after this, Jesus, knowing all that was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A bowl full of vinegar stood there, so they put a sponge full of the vinegar on hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, hyssop is something that's referred to in the book of Exodus in the context of the Passover. So let's turn now to Exodus chapter 12. We're going to look at verse 22. Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, select lambs for yourselves according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin, and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood which is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. So hyssop is used at the Passover with the specific purpose of allowing 
the Passover sacrifice to have its salvific effect by using the hyssop to paint the doorposts with the blood of the sacrificed lamb, the angel of death would pass over the houses so marked and thus save the firstborn sons of those homes from being slain. Likewise, Jesus, upon receiving the vinegar on a sprig of hyssop, accepted that, as he put it, in order that the work of redemption might be completed, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And a chief fulfillment that he is concerned with here is fulfilling Passover. The Lamb of God seeks to effect the same work of redemption on behalf of all humanity that the Passover lamb affects on behalf of the Hebrew families of the Exodus. But this isn't all. If we look at John chapter 19, immediately following this, we get uh, the following narrative that follows immediately from the death of Jesus. Since it was the day of preparation, in order to prevent the bodies from remaining on the cross on the Sabbath, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Now, if we look back at Exodus 12, we look at verse 46, we see the following interesting detail. In one house shall the lamb be eaten. You shall not carry forth any of the flesh outside the house, and you shall not break a bone of it. So the lamb of God fulfills what we see with the Passover lamb. No bone shall be broken of the Passover lamb. Likewise, no bone shall be broken of the lamb of God. Now, the Passover lamb is not merely sacrificed. It is also eaten. So if we go back a little bit in Exodus to 12, uh, starting at verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs in the evening. They, then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat them. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled with water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I shall pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you upon the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall fall upon you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So in order for the Passover sacrifice to be efficacious, the sacrificed lamb must be eaten. There are no two ways about it. Must be eaten. Must be eaten completely given in painstaking detail. So how are we to think about this with regard to Jesus, the Lamb of God? If he indeed is offering a true Passover sacrifice as the Lamb of God, then it is incumbent upon us to eat of the sacrifice. So let's read in the Gospel of Mark um, a little bit about this. So this is Mark chapter 14. We're going to start at verse 12. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, not a coincidence, 
his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the householder, The teacher says, Where is my guest room? Where am I to eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There, prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. Let's skip ahead to verse 22. So we see at this point, the Jesus... And his disciples are assembling for the Passover meal in fulfillment of the command from Exodus to eat the Passover meal. And it's in this context that we now look at verse 22 to 25. And as they were eating, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a chalice, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So right here, we actually have the answer to our question. That is, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and said to his disciples, this is my body. He shares the sacrifice of his body under the appearance of bread and wine. But it is truly his body, even if the senses cannot discern more than this. And it's really something to contemplate the idea that through eating, through a meal, we can be in the very presence of God because Jesus is truly present under the appearance of bread and wine. And thus, whenever we take the Eucharist, that's Jesus. We are in his presence as much as we would be had we been following him there during his earthly life. And it's not even unprecedented that through sacrifice, through a sacrificial meal, one might enter into the presence of God. Let's go back to Exodus. We're going to go to chapter 24 now. We're going to start at verse 5. So Exodus 24, 5. Moses sent young men of the sons of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. We'll skip ahead to verse 8. And Moses took the blood and threw it upon the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet as if it were a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. This is a striking passage and often underappreciated. Of course, there was the reference to uh, Moses sprinkling the blood of the sacrifice and proclaiming it as the blood of the covenant, a line, a passage that Jesus quite deliberately echoes in the Eucharistic institution narrative we saw in Mark chapter 14. But also we should savor the detail that Moses and Aaron and 70 of the elders of Israel saw the God of Israel after completing the sacrifice. So too do we when we enter into communion with the Lord. So too do we. It's an amazing thing to contemplate, an incredible thing to contemplate. Through sacrifice, the experience, the presence of God. But God did not have this as their only experience of his presence. To see another example of this, we turn now 
to the book of Kings. So 1 Kings chapter 8, uh, we're going to start at verse 6. So, oops. So, verse 6. Then the priests brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house, in the most holy place, underneath the wings of the cherubim. Skipping to verse 9. There was nothing in the Ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the sons of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. So what we see here is that the Ark of the Covenant, having housed the two tablets of the law, which were inscribed by the very finger of God, that ark then was a special locus of the presence of the Lord, and Solomon undertook the construction of the temple to house the Ark of the Covenant and likewise be a locus for God's presence on earth. And we see here in 1 Kings that God indeed gave them a sign that he was truly present in the temple. The temple then became the center of worship for the ancient Jewish people because of its role in housing the Ark of the Covenant and thus being the center of God's presence on earth. In light of that idea, we're going to go back to the Gospel of John. We're going to go to John chapter 2, starting at verse 13, and explore what the temple meant to Jesus. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem yet again, Passover. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers at their business. And making a whip of cords, he drove them out all with the sheep and oxen out of the temple. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. You shall not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign have you to show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. So we see in this passage that Jesus fully intends to supersede the temple sacrifices. The temple sacrifices were going to cease. And from now on, the presence of the Lord would be made manifest to believers on earth in the presence of his holy body. So to summarize uh, this section of, of the presentation, the Hebrew people were set free of bondage to Pharaoh through the Passover sacrifice. We, in turn, are set free from bondage to the devil, we, all of humanity, by the death of Jesus on the cross. This death of Jesus is a true Passover sacrifice, and this Passover sacrifice must be consumed. But now we need to think about how, how to make sense of this idea. We've seen hints of it in Mark's account of the institution narrative. Take, eat, this is my body, he said at Passover. But there's more to see to gain a deeper understanding of what Jesus is calling us to in the Eucharist. And we'll explore that in the next video as we take uh, an even deeper exploration 
of the Gospel of John and what the evangelist John has to share with us about the nature of the Eucharist, the bread of life. See you then.